The following podcast contains alcohol-enhanced conversations about alcohol, as well as a potential for discussions about topics of dubious, disturbing, possibly offensive, but usually hilarious interest. The opinions stated herein are solely of the persons making them, and any endorsement of these opinions by any other party is not implied. Foul language is likely, but intolerant viewpoints are not. Listener intoxication is advised. Hello and welcome to episode 64 of the Neat Glass Sponsored Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Ed. And today we're concluding our trilogy of episodes tracking the progression of America's favorite spirit. In part one, episode 62, we discussed the early days of whiskey distilling with Moonshine and White Dog. And in part two, episode 63, we covered the rules not only of bourbon, but also of two legal whiskey types that are almost, but not quite bourbons, corn whiskey and light whiskey. But this is Bourbon Evolution 3, where we connect the dots from bourbon's past to bourbon's present, finally get to taste nothing but bourbon on a full episode in over a year and then explore what the future of bourbon might look like. And helping us in all those endeavors are two whiskey industry experts, one you know and one you don't, Anders the Master Mixologist, and as is customary, Ed will introduce the new guest as well as the finely bourbons that we'll be furiously funneling into our faces tonight. <laughs> yeah, Anders, good to see you. Good to be seen. Hey, Anders. Or heard. And joining us for the first time, Taylor from Benash. She is one of the cogs in the machine of the Benash Empire. Uh, say hi, Taylor. Hello, people of the podcast. Here I am. I have, in fact, arrived. Yes. Right. Welcome to the podcast. Huzzah. Right. Happy to be here, everybody. Happy to be here. All right. Uh, All right. Uh, We've just excited. Yes. I've escaped the confines of Benash for uh, <laughs> at least a short amount of time. Yes. yes. If you want to go to Benash right now and just grab stuff, there's nobody there because we've got her here. It yeah. is true. Yeah. I might have locked somebody in there tonight. Oh, Actually, no. I closed really quickly, and there oh. could be like a one family left just like scrounging. Right. We probably have enough leverage to get her on here. Like, all right, all right, all right, I'll come on if you guys will stop asking me every day. Yeah. Uh, will there be snacks there? All right. I guess I'll come. <laughs> Maybe yeah. a couple of lollipops. So we are are thrilled to finally drink really good bourbons today mm. after putting in a full day's work for everybody out there in podcastville drinking really questionable moonshine to consume <laughs> um, and and some interesting not terrible but not something i would get up in the morning to drink corn whiskeys mm. we now have some special expressions of bourbon and we're going to break this into three rounds first we're going to talk from the past to the present how bourbon got where we are And we're going to choose a Joseph Mangus triple cast finish. That's 100 proof. Uh, And then we're going to come back and talk about the current state of bourbon and taste Old Elk single barrel, 123.3 proof. Old Elk has made a huge splash the last three years, I guess. And we'll talk about how I don't like the name. Okay. But we'll get, we'll get to why that is. Okay. You got something against Elks here? I have a problem with the name, and I'll explain that. It's an inferior lodge. The, um, Sorry to all those uh, elks listening. <laughs> hey, anywhere you can get like a dollar beer, I'll be at. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. And then we'll come back with the last round and talk about the future of bourbon. And this is what we're really counting on our experts to kind of weigh in. Mm-hmm. And we have an expression from and or about Taylor <laughs> that will help explore that. And, um, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so we'll go from there. So Scott, take us into round one and what we're doing. And Yeah, so I uh, just want to connect the dots from the past two episodes that we did and get us up to speed on where bourbon is today. This is mostly from an article titled Defining Moments in History of Bourbon by Aaron Goldfarb, posted at vinepair.com. I whittled them down. He had like 24. There was too many. And it's just a sentence or two, about a dozen. So here we go. Yes. All right. Let's do it. Bourbon used to be so simple. A humble, economically priced spirit from Kentucky. You could drink it neat or with ice, maybe even mixed with soda. Over two centuries of existence, it was always there and often less than 20 bucks a bottle. Whether you favor Jim or Jack or even one of the olds. Wild turkey. <laughs> yeah, or wild turkey. Or old crow if your days aren't going well. That's old right. crow. Old crow, oh. granddad, or old weller. A lot of old. Yeah, a lot of old. And then the 2000s came and bourbon lost its damn mind. <laughs> Distilleries began releasing bourbons that cost hundreds of dollars 
drinkers cleared them from store shelves. Black markets arose to sell those bottles online for even more money. Suddenly, the only bourbon anyone could find anymore were those humble, economically priced Jims and Jacks and Olds that have always been there for us. In bourbon, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. We always look for Larceny Bowerproof on here. It's won awards at the One Hour Whiskey Madness. And yet, any store you go into, there is cases of regular Larceny, which they could easily bottle at barrel strength any time that they want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they just choose not to. No, they don't. Even as bourbon has tried to reinvent itself and longtime distilleries have come out with new inventive expressions, they still clog the shelves with dozens and dozens of bottles of their name brands the original stuff yeah. that mm-hmm. brought them to where they are. Yeah. There's not a store you can go into where you won't be able to find regular wild turkey, regular old granddad, regular white label Jim Beam, and of course, Jack Daniels. Right, exactly. So Aaron's first half dozen defining moments that he had dealt with the Scotch-Irish settlers, the Whiskey Rebellion, barrel aging, and how the rules of the whiskey and bourbon were codified into law after Prohibition, which is all of the things that we covered in parts one and two. So we pick up the story in 1935. When Pappy Van Winkle opened Stitzel Weller, eventually making waves for adding wheat to their bourbon brands, and I'm sure he had no idea of the kind of influence that his formulation and name would have almost 60 years later. In 1947, Frank Sinatra started swigging Jack Daniels, claiming that Jackie Gleason told him it was a man's drink, becoming the brand's biggest fan, raising the profile of all whiskey, and perhaps most impressive, finishing off an entire bottle of old number seven every day, just like Lenny from Motorhead. <laughs> wait, wait, Frank Sinatra drank a bottle jack every day? Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's impressive. Uh, I can attest to this. I have a friend, actually, who works now in AC, and uh, he did his rider when he had a show down there towards the end. So on it was like Santa Margarita, Pina Grigio, Jack Daniels, a shitload of booze. He's a little bit older. He's doing shows with Frank Jr. and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. you know so famous people. We get it. I, I don't know. He's, I know a guy who knew famous people. He knew I'm a guy not, who knew a guy. I'm not that cool. So he ends up doing the thing and gets like booze in there and then gets a call from Nancy Sinatra being like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, yeah. Why is there alcohol in here? Frank will be a fucking mess. He has to do two shows tonight. And so he takes all the bottles and puts them in like a broom closet. It. So then Frank Sinatra shows up and is like, what the fuck? Where is my, my whiskey? God damn and my whiskey. <laughs> so he goes and brings it back and then gets hammered, does his first set, and then his son has to finish the second. Oh, one. no. Wow. Oh, yeah, so that's, he that, probably that, did drink a whole bottle of drink. Probably did. Very quickly in, in yes. sheer spite yes. of uh, Nancy there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. okay, so in 1954, a 19-year-old Jimmy Russell joined the JTS Brown Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, wow. initially just to sweep floors, but after quickly moving up the ranks, by the late 1960s, he was the master distiller at what today is called Wild Turkey. In 1958, Maker's Mark creates the premium bourbon category when Bill Samuels Sr. launches his bourbon in the now iconic red wax-dipped square-shaped bottle, which was considered at the time to be the industry's Rolls Royce in a parking lot full of Pintos. Wow. I just saw a little documentary that talked about this. All bottles were like $4 a bottle and they came out at seven yeah like wow almost you double I mean? so right, like, right. Like, so yeah. that's like all bottles being around 50 or 60 and you coming out with the 120 we have like hmm, mm. look how special you think you are <laughs> old elk sorry <laughs> never mind go ahead <laughs> <laughs> in 1964 bourbon gets named a distinctive product of the united states by congressional resolution after industry bigwigs become paranoid that the rest of the world has eyes on stealing america's signature spirit which reiterated its manufacturing rules and established that it can only be made in america Right, it made the first hats that said, Make America Drunk Again. <laughs> Matter? <laughs> I'm, I'm, ma- I'm mad at you. They are now available on the podcast website, That's everybody. Right. Yeah. Right, make America Drunk Again. That's right. 1969, white spirits like vodka and gin started taking over the bar scene, and in response, distilleries came up with light whiskey, which we tasted last time, distilled to a higher proof and aged for short periods in uncharred or used barrels. Mm. It was a failure, and by the early 1980s, bourbon sales had bottomed out. Right. In 1984, the single barrel arrives on the scene, but only Japan seemed to care at first. After the ancient age distillery asked Master Distiller Elmer T. Lee to create a -a one-of-a-kind product using some honey barrels from Warehouse H, which became Blanton. The world's first commercial single barrel bourbon made primarily for Japan, it was a sensation there. Yes. In 1988, the small batch arrives on the scene when Jim Beam releases Booker's, a small batch barrel proof bourbon in 1988, and then four years later added the small batch brands Baker's, Basil Hayden, and Non Creek. 
1994, Julian Van Winkle III, already selling the 12 and 15-year-old bourbons acquired from Stitzel Weller, got the gumption to release a then unheard of 20-year-old bourbon to much critical acclaim, a spirit he named Pappy Van Winkle after his grandfather. Never heard of that. No, no. Mm-hmm. What, what's that? In 1999, the bourbon trail was created to capitalize on the renewed interest in bourbon and the distilleries wisely moved to be included, opening gift shops and offering public tours. The bourbon trail now brings over half a million tourists to Kentucky each year, but not me or Ed. Yet. Also <sighs> me. I have never been to Kentucky. Well, uh, Shout Anders? out. Have you? No. Oh, shit. The pandemic definitely slowed that down. That's for sure. We didn't go anywhere for two years, so we were supposed to go last summer. It didn't happen. I think we'll get it done this year. Ruined everything for us, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, it was hard to go down and pick barrels because we were broke. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I mean, I was just living in a constant crisis of uh, people trying to physically assault the professional cashiers. Oh, right. We had a good time, yeah. Right. You were the guys who were the only ones open and everyone wanted I am an essential employee. (laughs) You sure were. I am going to wave that over my I had yep. doctors, get- nurses, liquor store employees. Did you get hazard pay? Mm. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I got a shift drink, which was, oh. hey, Taylor, do you want a fireball shot? And I was like, I would actually rather die. Thank you. <laughs> Good answer. But I still took it. It was a long day. Okay, so uh, we have four more, and then we'll get to drinking. Yes. 2007, non-Kentucky bourbons start to appear because, of course, Kentucky isn't the only state legally allowed to make bourbon, despite what your brother-in-law says. (laughs) In 2012, (laughs) the secondary market emerges as a result of highly sought-after bottles disappearing from store shelves, Pappy first and foremost. Suddenly, people are flipping whiskey on eBay and Craigslist, eventually migrating to Facebook groups, although Facebook officially shut them down. They're still there, just using less obvious names and less overt methods of buying and selling. In 2014, industry's dirty little secret that there was somehow all these new craft distilleries making great whiskey but who weren't actually distilling anything at all comes to light. It was of course coming from MGP, the mega distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, which grew from the ashes of the Seagram's empire after it had been shuttered and sold for parts. And the last one we have is 2020. Barrel picks become the norm when bars, Anders, and liquor stores, Taylor, and private whiskey groups all start buying single barrel picks from distilleries. We have two tonight. Some even begin adding their own goofy bottle decals after which an Eagle Rare or Russell's Reserve with a 50 cent sticker on it is somehow magically worth hundreds of dollars millions the industry may not have fully jumped the shark yet but these days if you want to you can probably buy a bottle with a shark on it (laughs) shark in it or in it. Oh, yeah. So that's pretty comprehensive. Shark whiskey, shark, do, 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 whiskey, shark. <laughs> I think he missed three major things because just in the past yes. four years that we've been doing the podcast, I've noticed an explosion of finishing in different barrels, yes. blending yes. those barrels together and bottling at cask strength. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're right because blending used to be a no no. Right. Like blended scotches were all right, but blended Definitely bourbons goes. was like you just took the rat gut that was laying around. <laughs> not rat gut. It was, it was like, like a rot rot gut. <laughs> Like a scrabble, oh, yeah. scrapple, Ra- yeah, like, right. 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 whiskey right. scrabble, Wh- scrapple, scrapple, whiskey scrapple, yeah. whiskey scrapple. <laughs> right? Whiskey scrapple T-shirts are available at whiskey tangent. <laughs> whiskey tangent podcast um, um, comes with a free whoopie pie. So the um. <laughs> But yeah, so blended bourbon used to be terrible. <laughs> mm-hmm. And now some of the most expensive expressions are like, well, look, they blended five different bourbons together. Like, yeah. Oh my God, look at how much they put in. It's like a complete turnaround. And so, so go ahead, Scott, what's your six? Yeah, the six hallmarks of the current state of bourbon, sourcing, finishing, blending, longer aged, cast strength, and barrel picks. And the first two whiskeys that we have here tonight embody all of those six, with yeah. the Joseph Magnus being sourced, finished, blended, and longer aged. And Ed's going to tell you a little bit about it before we taste it. Also, I gotta say, thank God we made it through to the 2000s because this whole time I've been doing outfit changes to fit. (laughs) <laughs> the the years. Yes. So I am already like winded, ready to go, but yeah. now we are dressed for today. Right. right. So, she, had a, she had on a powdered wig with yeah. like a gigam dress. Yeah, and she I, had a mini skirt in the 60s. It was, Your depression it was look intense. was fire. Thank yeah, you that, very much. She was a flapper. Yeah. yeah. The 70s, yeah. that was like really garish colors. That was straight yeah. gel bottoms. You know. Yeah, it's really a bummer yeah. that like this wasn't live because it was no. like almost like Vegas style <laughs> magician ring. Yeah, it was like a share show in here for us. Yeah, there's confetti everywhere. And somehow we didn't get pictures of any of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Weird. What a shame. It's okay. Scott, it was like the time we saw Bigfoot in the woods. Remember, we, damn, if we only had a camera. <laughs> it's okay. We got to keep something secret. So, yeah, the, the, shout out Bigfoot. Thanks for listening. <laughs> the Joseph Magus triple cast finished bourbon. Yeah. This description comes to us from our good friends at Breaking Bourbon, who don't know us, but we know them. Yes. Originally started by Joseph A. Magnus in 1892, the company focused on producing whiskey until Prohibition took hold. Afterwards, the brand was revitalized when Joseph Magnus's great, great, great. Let me try this again. Is that his plural? Magnus's. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Magni. All right. Magni. <laughs> Magni? <laughs> Afterwards, the brand was revitalized when Joseph Magnus's great grandson discovered a few unopened bottles bearing the family namesake. Did he? Reestablishing in 2015, the company <laughs> now focuses on blending awesome. and finishing techniques initially employed by Joseph Magnus himself. Today, Joseph Magnus is stated to be a bourbon that is as close as possible to the original bourbon initially discovered by his great-grandson. I guess they took it and sent it to the FBI lab at Quantico. <laughs> the bourbon is straight bourbon whiskey that is triple cast finished in Oloroso Sherry, Pedro Jimenez Sherry, and <laughs> Cognac Casks. Right. This is a 100 proof bourbon and there's no age statement, but it says on its website that it's 12 years aged, six to 12 months in the casks right. after the initial age. The mash bill yeah. is not disclosed. The blender bottle or company, Joseph A. Magnus and Company of Holland, Michigan. The source distillery is undisclosed Kentucky and Indiana distilleries, but almost certainly NGP. The price is about 100 and it won gold yeah. at the San Francisco World Spirits and competition. To, to be fair... I got this for, I believe, 89 Oh, good price. Okay. Dope. All right. Epinash? Um, Just say yes. Yeah, no, I think I, yes, <laughs> yes, I, yes, yes, Indeed. yes. Oh, there we go. Sure. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I'm out of here. Bye, everybody. All right, so Catch me that's what's in your knee glasses right here. You got the, the lid on. You can swirl it to oh. enhance aromas. I don't think I've ever had a lid. Oh, yeah. It doesn't last that long for me. Fancy. So what is a one sip and done right? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Clearly. Drink responsible, yeah, everybody. That's right. Mm. Oh, the nose is really fruity. Cherries. I get orange and honey. <laughs> Scott always gets cherry. I always, you always get, orange. get orange. Well, there is dark fruit, so. Yeah. Stone like. Fruit. I'm not getting cherry though. Hold on. Yeah, maybe it's no, not cherry. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe, yeah, or maybe a plum, something like that. But it's definitely. I got That's orange in the initial thing. I do get a lighter citrusy thing too. Yeah, very vanilla, very sweet, um, honey vanilla. Yeah, it's almost like a little jammy. Mm -hmm. If you you're at your like parents or grandparents' place and trying to make a PDB and J, and they've got like yeah. paint us a picture. <laughs> yes, they've got grape, got, like raspberry. orange marmalade. Ooh. I'm like, do we want to? Yeah. It's jammy. Marmalade. It's marmalade. I'm judging well, you. It's jammy. It's jammy. Marmalade. It's jammy. Won't you drink jammy I'm with me? Jam. Hope you like jamming too. We jam it, we jam it, we jam it, we jam it, we jam All right. Crick is like, hey, Scott, it's a Sunday. This is time and a half. You know it's also jamming? The shot glasses that you got me for Christmas that one year? Oh, yeah. Oh. They are also jamming. They were like antique shot glasses from like the oh, 30s. right. They were with my costume, so. Right. So uh, what are you getting on the nose? Taylor. <laughs> From I, like, I like how he paused like he had to look the name on, yeah, on the crib like, sheet. He's like, Tyler, what do you think is going on there? I did literally forget her name. For <laughs> yes, like no, four I could seconds. tell it. It was written all over his face. Yeah, like, the name uh, is gone. Uh, uh, I mean, if you really sniff into it, there's a lot of heat on it. Yeah. There is. That's why I was giving it a second because I was waiting for the post lid. Yeah. I got to tell you, I don't, get, I don't get that much heat on it. Uh, not on the nose. Maybe it's me, but you know, the knee glass does a good job diffusing yeah, no, it. Yeah, the knee glass like diffused it. That's why I gave it a couple seconds. And once yeah. again, while she's uh, nosing it, if while you, I'm sticking the snarls in there. If you haven't mm -hmm. picked yourself up two, four, six, or 10 knee glasses, go to kneeglass.com. And if you put in whiskey tan, you get 10% off your first order. I'm getting a little bit more cinnamon now that I've given oh. it a minute. And I feel like I don't know if it's me or painting this toast picture mm. in my grandma's. I'm getting side. a little bit of like almost a French toast kind of vibe. Ooh, yeah. interesting. Right? Which could have cinnamon in it. Yeah. Are we drinking it? Yeah, let's taste yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. Taste it. Yes. The time has come, everyone. Wow, it's 
Ooh, really nice. Yeah. That's really nice. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. There's even a bit of peanuts Ooh. on there to go with the jam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little bit of peanut butter. That's like really on like the finish for mm. me. I okay. That mm. like the yeah. nuttiness. Yeah. 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 Interesting. It's very sweet initially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like for the, sure. All the vanilla and honey's right in the front. And then, yes. you, then you get this real spiciness on the way out. It's mm-hmm. like right now my tongue is just sizzling. Yes. Yeah. Like, and then afterwards, you can kind of taste the wine cherry influence yeah. on your tongue after it's all gone. Yeah. You get like a nice little mm. deep richness there. It yeah. does stick around a it's little while. It's got a yeah. quite nice finish to it. Does it mention how long they do the aging, Scott? Did you find that? Uh, six to 12 months in the three <clears throat> casks, but it didn't say how long in each. But originally? 12 years. Oh, shit. This is 12 years? How did I miss that? Yeah. No wonder it tastes so damn good. So it says the internet. <laughs> then for $90, it's the bargain. $100, 12 years, finished mm-hmm. three times. Now, I've heard a lot about the cigar cast finish. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes I have. And also. I have not had that yet. Yeah. But people really make a big deal out of that. So, you know. Yes, I have had the cigar cast. And mm. I will say, it is incredibly tasty. And I've had... <laughs> There's a butt coming. <laughs> well, I've oh. had multiple years of the cigar finish because people are lovely enough to either crack it and offer you a pour offer me a tiny pour mainly there in the liquor store so they'll do that (laughs) most of the time as like a sign that they are not going to sell it on the secondary oh i see yes as a sign of good faith oh and i also have like lots of tiny jars that people just pour you know a little sample i'll I'll sample it later yeah not counting bars there's no place in the world that is a store i've drank more in my life than (laughs) yeah i mean if i'm ever having a bad mood I just stop in there to shop and I end up getting like three, four tastes and I walk out I'm like, yeah, life's not that bad. Yeah. So, yeah. We, we chat, it's, it's, we talk yeah. about life. Yeah. We like, cause we, you know, yeah. we have all the of line, our store pe- picks Yeah, the open. line yeah. just gets longer and, you know, we're in the lotus position just behind the counter. Just it's like true. Talking. I'm like, you know, relax your shoulders <laughs> and, you know, unclench your jaw. Mm. Everyone listening right now, do that. Ooh, but yeah, the cigar cast. I will say that the one two years ago, absolutely funky fresh, mm. super good. And the newer ones were like, they're okay. Okay, not as good. Not mm. as good. Mm. Not as good. Not <laughs> worth people violently fighting for them in the parking lot. Yeah. Oh, wow. I was going to say, I also had one of the more recent cigar malts, okay. and I was like, this is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This isn't like war crimes good. It right. didn't right. suck, right? right? What's a shame is you take a really good whiskey and somehow put a negative slant in your mind because it doesn't meet the hype that you've been hearing about. Yeah. It. Right. But yet, it's, it's a great whiskey. Yeah. yeah. I have to tell you that the four drops or five drops that I put on, sometimes we say it doesn't help. It helped this a lot. It's yeah. supposed to burn out just enough mm-hmm. to open up some really hidden flavors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm getting a little more of an herbaceous note on the end now. I was just like say. like a tobacco or something. I get or? so much brown sugar after having dropped like five drops into it. Once I swallow it, brown sugar taste. Mm. Yeah, the nose. I think I put like three drops wow. in there, and the nose just like blossomed. It opened. Oh my god! Right it, up. Yeah. The five drops of water made this exceptional. All right, yeah. I'll add the extra two. Yeah, this is wonderful. I committed to it. This is really good. All right, you want to hear from breaking bourbon? Or? Sure. Okay. All right, yeah, bourbon. go ahead. Wow me. So on the nose, orange rind drizzled with light honey, a rush of ripe dark fruits, buttercream frosted cake, Hmm. light Hmm. leather, and the slightest hint of ethanol. And you all said you smelled alcohol (laughs) on the nose. Leather's an interesting note on the nose. I didn't get that on the nose, but that's okay. I'm very hungry now (laughs) and also want to bite on a couch. Oh, Anybody oh, else feel that way? I don't know. My couch isn't leather. Uh, well, your couch is lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I got other leather things in my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, goodness. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Uh, oh, my. Yeah. I've got the vapors. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, mercy. <Goodness. laughs> so, on the palate, this will make God happy. Initially sweet with cherry pie filling, beep, beep, beep. vanilla, okay. and brown sugar. Oh, sugar. oh my goodness. But then dark, dark fruits pop up, helping to bridge the transition to drier notes of oak and leather. Hmm. They're loving the leather. They yeah. are. Yeah. And then on the finish, green peppercorn, oak leather, a hint of tobacco leaf, more immediately leather. pop, mm. then morph into a lingering dry oak with a, this is very funny, a slight hint of medicinal cherry similar to a Hall's cough drop. <laughs> I would argue Luden's more because wow. Hall's is going to have the menthol, but if you yeah. just want the yeah. medicinal cherry, Luden's is a better... Yeah, uh, there's drink. no menthol, but I agree. Right. I, I, I do want to stand on a mountaintop and... Uh, yeah. Ricola! Sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. that's Ricola. I, oh, I, 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 yeah. So, um, do we agree that this is a nice complex whiskey? Oh, oh yeah. I agree. This is one of the best whiskeys I've ever had in a while. Yeah, if you can find it for under 100 like Ed did at Banash, 
Hey, what's up? Yep. Absolutely, it's a steal. Yep. And it's a good looking bottle. It's going to look sexy on your bar. No, it is. And it's something that if you don't want to spend that much, then don't. Get <laughs> uh, you know, Wild Turkey 101. It's $27. It'll get you there. You can live yeah, there. You'll be fine. Yeah, that's one proof more than this. Get that old granddad <laughs> get, 114, baby. Oh, yeah. Or, or the, or the, yeah, or the um, mm-hmm. Bottle and Bond. Evan right? Williams oh, Bond the Bottle and Bond's great. Evan yeah. Williams Bottle and Bond is a yeah. staple at my home. Yeah, yes. for sure. Yes. For sure. Yes. All right, that's it for this one. We're going to take a break, clean the glasses. We're going to be back with the current state of bourbon and taste ourselves some the Old Elk Single Barrel 123.3. We're going to need more than five drops of water for that, I think. Oh, yeah. All right, and so uh, we'll be right back. We're back for round two now. Looking at the current state of bourbon, yeah, and asking, is it broken? I don't think it's broken. I think it's better than ever, but there is some flaws to it. Well, we'll talk about that. Like anything growing, yeah, I'm jumping the gun on that. <laughs> and we're going to enjoy a Benash barrel pick of Old Elk single barrel. This That's is right. picked by the gang of Benash, and Taylor's a part of that. You can speak on that. Yes. And Scott, take us into what the current state of bourbon looks like. Yeah. So I ran into a lot in my research of this episode in the current state of bourbon about people asking, is bourbon broken? And in particular. The secondary market is that ruining bourbon. And I just want to read you a few. Yes. A couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yes. The, Hard yes. Uh, I say no, but we'll I talk concur. About yes, in red. The, um, no, unless you allow it to, but go ahead. Okay. So, three paragraphs from a blog posted at Whiskey Jar in 2019 by a man named. By Taylor. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. It was written by Ang- me. Angry Whiskey Woman 17. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brad Drell is the guy's name. And I thought this would be a good jumping off point for a discussion. So, what he says is one of the things that really caught my eye this week was a post on the Friends of the Trace, meaning Buffalo Trace, Facebook group asking the question if members of the group had become our own worst enemies in promoting the wonderful whiskeys from Buffalo Trace, given the bourbon shortage and secondary market flippers. Did we somehow, simply by sharing one of life's greatest pleasures, good bourbon, make it impossible to get any good bourbon for ourselves? Other bourbon groups complain endlessly about upstart NDP releases said to be from magical barrels found in an old distillery and then bottled and sold at exorbitant prices because what's in those bottles is both too young and too awful. Still, others complain about the loss of age statements and the decrease in quality of what's in the marketplace because demand has completely outstripped supply. Good bourbon is impossible to get because it gets hoarded and flipped and true bourbon devotees are left with the dregs. And on the off chance that someone posts about a lesser known bourbon that is really good, it's met with a joking shh comment because of the very real expectation that it'll go the way of W.L. Weller, a bourbon I used to mix with Coke that now fetches ridiculously high prices on the secondary market. And the comment I see most, all the good bourbon is gone and it's never coming back. Bullshit. That's a bullshit statement. I understand his point, but he's focusing on the wrong part of the industry. We've talked many times on here about how prohibition was a nightmare, breaking down a thriving industry into six distilleries, right? And it's taken a hundred years to get close to where it was before prohibition. Hundreds and hundreds of different distilleries, all trying to compete with each other to make something different and new and exciting. And intermingled with that is almost like a nostalgia for some of the stuff that it's hard to get anymore. Mm -hmm. The Blanton's Gold in Japan or the Pappy for $3,000. Everything's becoming the Johnny Walker Blue. Like, I can't tell you having a whiskey podcast how many times people who aren't really whiskey people go, oh, yeah, whiskey podcast? What do you think of that Johnny Walker Blue, huh? (laughs) I think it's overpriced swill. That's what I think of it. I think it's all hype. It might be good, but it's not worth what they charge for it, just like so many other things. And so, you know, what i do i choose not to drink johnny walker blue and the point is there's hundreds of good whiskeys of great quality and great flavor coming out like the joseph mangas that we just tasted and the old standpoints like bakers or bookers which are still there and still good and still relatively affordable compared to what's out there but if you get stuck on what you can't get you'll be disappointed and i think that's what zell or david whatever his name was is talking about yes i'd love to have blanton's any day i want because i enjoy it at 60 dollars, not 115 scott me raved about about Midwinter's Night Dram from High West when it was $100. 
It was a treat for us. Hey, let's right. buy one this year. It's one hundred eight dollars. Now it's two ninety nine at Morrow Brothers, who is insane. And I'll put them out there because they need to rein in their prices. They really do. They so, did just do their customer appreciation. I know, and I feel appreciated. But the reality is, you are appreciated. I focus on what I can drink, and if I can get a nine year Knob Creek for thirty six dollars, there's no reason for me to complain that I can't drink anything. So, uh, counterpoint from Taylor. <sighs> so. Um, <laughs> Deep breath. Because I think she deals with the assholes I'm talking about who come in looking for this. I do. I can't believe you um, don't have this. You call yourself a liquor store. Exactly. So they're cherry pickers is what they are. Yeah. My dad, Rich from Banash. Cherry likes Manhattan. Hi, dad. <laughs> we typically on the weekends go against each other, have a tally <laughs> of who gets the most phone calls for Blanton's. I oh, love, I love wow. it. Yes. So far, I hold the record for one Saturday Jess, myself, got 36 phone calls oh, for Blanton's. Shut your mouth. That's yes. absurd. Yes. And the best is when it's like, do you have any Blantines? Wow. Do you have any <laughs> Blantines? Do you mean Ballantines? I've said that. I was like, is that what you're looking for? And they're like, no, it's got a horse on it. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, God damn it. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. I'm sure you like, don't want We to have this Pikesville. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, um, do you mean Pinhook? That has a horse right, on it. Right. That's got a horse on it, yeah. too. Calibut? Today, I actually got an email asking if we had it. The title was Blanton's Bourbon. They're like, do you have it? How can I get it? And I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, well, at least it was a nicely worded email. Just kidding. It's crazy the fascination that that brand has it is. acquired. And the worst part is, especially during the holidays, people will send like in their great aunts and their moms and they'll be like, my nephew really wants this for Christmas. And it'll be like Pappy 23 and Blanton's and E.H. Taylor. Things that you can't get. And I'm like, okay, have. listen. I'm like, you can get this, but it's going to be a car payment. <laughs> like, no, yeah. I'm, I'm going to talk a minute because I think it's important. But Nash, because mm. she won't talk about this because she's too modest, but... <laughs> But Nash doesn't do what a lot of them do. They don't take a stag and mark it up for another $300. They have lotteries. And it's a way they give back to their customers where other places hold you hostage with it. Like, mm. oh, you want this? Well, we paid 110 for it, but I'm going to charge you $400 for it. And we all know that you're doing that. There could be somebody with money to burn that goes like, oh, I've heard about, well, they're all spend $400 for it. Well, then, all right, if that's what you're waiting for. Right but up. then you're really crapping on all your regulars who would enjoy that I bottle know. as a treat for giving you thousands of dollars. And that's what Benash does. Benash knows that we come there they have a loyal customer base i remember i walked in and they had a henry mckenna behind the counter for 39 dollars. it was behind the counter because everybody wants it but they were giving me the exact price this was probably three years ago right after it won the award so walking in and seeing that and it told me everything about that liquor store that i need to know mm. that they were not going to gouge me and that's what you want your local liquor store one that will not gouge you and banash not only do they bring us incredible barrel picks that we talk about monthly on here they also really care about their customers and it really kind of cherish us yeah. oh. So go ahead, Taylor. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, don't be. We're a weird bunch. So basically, it's been a family business like forever. People ask like the origin name of Banash. So Mm. it was the Banash brothers. I thought you were Indians for years. A lot of people really think that. Yeah, (laughs) and it is. Yeah, Banash. Banash. Yeah, a lot of people do think that. Banash liquors. Hello. (laughs) Yes. And people walk in and they're like, people walk in and they're like, what? Oh. But uh, yeah, so it was the Banash brothers, and then my great uncle bought into it. My great aunt. Aunt Pat is there multiple days a week. She just turned 82. So heck yeah. We love Aunt Pat. She's a queen. Happy birthday. Yes. Her son is Bill. Everybody knows Bill. Bill. Uh, Billy. Billy. Yes. He's the one who turns Ed into every short that we've had. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Bill is like a brain. The information just, everything sticks. It's wild. (laughs) Yeah. I was at the Benash today to see Taylor and also pick up a bourbon that might have represent the future of bourbon, Mm -hmm. which we'll taste later. And she's like, let me call Billy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Bill always uh, expects a phone call from me on Sunday. So Anders, from your perspective, uh, being a bar manager behind the bar and people coming in asking for Blanton's or Pappy Van Winkle or things that you can't possibly get. I mean, that has to happen, right? I do love a 60 year old man who walks in like not knowing the fuck what he's talking about. It's just like, you got any Pappy? This is a nice place. And after (laughs) I say, hi, how are you? Slips you a hundred dollars. Yeah, but that's not a feeling. How are you? <laughs> but do you no. have any pappy? Uh, no, that's not a. That's. <laughs> and then they walk out doing. immediately. Get yes, out. that happens to me all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and they walk out yeah. all the time. Eventually, they'll say like, "I'm well," and I'm like, I "You mean- are a well person." <laughs> um, no. <laughs> yeah. Speaking but- of well, you got any weller back there? 
<laughs> so what's funny about the bar that Andres works at, which is a local the eatery and pub in Mount Holly and the local lounge attached to it. Hell yeah. At last reporting that I know of has the most individual American whiskeys you can buy in the state. Is that correct? Uh, this is correct. And how many whiskeys are we up to? Uh, I'm going to say 300 right now, Ooh. but I Need will do plans. inventory tomorrow. Right. So you can have 300 different American whiskeys. You can't usually find Pappy. Well, no. Then I'm not going there. It, or, or, or George T. <laughs> Stagg. It's been there, but it's not, not there all the time. I get like one bottle in November. Yeah. All right. So no. Blanton's, yeah, there's Blanton's there sometimes, and sometimes there's not. But there's tons of great oh, stuff. Right. And if you ask them, I guarantee you, I'm just going to take you on a whiskey journey that will dwarf whatever you thought you had walking in the door. And that's the frustration I'm sure that he's going to talk about right now. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> another deep breath. <sighs> Unclench your jaw, relax your shoulders. Thank you. It's going to be a journey. Oh, wow. Well, I do need that for this journey. Mm. It feels good. I never want to shy people away from learning to appreciate whiskey. And I feel like where that kind of like cursory, like these are the names that I hear that I have to have. Mm. And I've got the budget for it. Okay. Why not try like... I don't know, Boss Hog, you got that for $100 a glass. If they, yeah. want, if they want to throw have their money. Have any of them. Have the yeah. four. You can't yeah. find that right. anywhere else. Right. 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 He, I mean, he, yeah, he I mean, has. he does have really expensive stuff. Yeah, if you like, want to spend $100, dangerous. he will give you $100 a glass of whiskey. He has it. He yeah. has Elijah Craig 18 year. He has somewhere hidden in the back the old Fitzgerald he laid around. Russell's 13. Yeah. That, yeah. that shit's sensational. You were there for that? Yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> what a night. What a night. I ate like three pounds of potatoes that night. It was not <laughs> enough potatoes. It was the best night of my life. And I actually had an entire like catering tray full of penne. <laughs> Oof. I was shameless. That is not oh. true. It was, no, I love it. Well, it was entirely true, actually. It was the best was a, night the of my life. The food was amazing that night. Yeah, the food Oof. was amazing. It was a blast. So yeah, it's like, try this Russell's tenure or like try this old Forester 1910. Something like similar in that space. You could right, actually find and buy it at your own. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you have 300 whiskeys. You have to have something either in their price or interest range. Yeah, exactly. Right? So that brings me to a second point that I saw when I was looking this up and somebody posited, it was actually breaking bourbon. Is there a small brand problem? He went to a party where it was a mm. bunch of guys who liked whiskey and he brought a small brand. But when he got there, everyone else had brought like big distillery brands from Jim Bean and mm-hmm. Buffalo Trace and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he brought a, one, a small one. He didn't try to sell it to them like, you know, hey, this is yeah, really good. Open it up. And as the evening went along and the, the levels were dropping, he noticed that his dropped the least. Mm-hmm. So people weren't really even curious to even try the small brands. Do you see that in yeah, absolutely. The, the bar? Yeah. How about in the liquor store, Taylor? Yes, if I'm not there to speak on some of those, the people just yeah, because we they just have buy lo- what they know, I yeah, guess. Yeah, or they act like a total jabroni about it <laughs> and are just so caught up and focused on one specific thing, or they read something in their local Facebook group. Oh, yeah. this one person hates rye, or this one yeah. person hates this, so I'm not going to like it. When mm. everybody's palate is so oh, yeah. different, you have to have, try new exactly, things. and that's why we have all of our private barrels open to try because they're so different. Like mm-hmm. we have a 95 five rye that just came in from Rare Character, and people are expecting it to be like so hot and spicy, and it's like brown sugar dessert, mm, yeah. like delightful ride and. That's the, the fuck? beauty this is of a it. So Scott, like, oh. yeah. Scott and I have tried 300 different whiskeys on air since we started the podcast. And I would say on our journey, we've been greatly influenced by the both of you mm-hmm. for giving us information of stuff we should try that we hadn't heard of. Like, have you heard of this? No, oh, you should try it. We don't go, oh, I never heard of it. Yeah, so be like, tried. this sounds weird. Or why does this have a right. buffalo on it? Right. I don't so, like buffaloes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. People <laughs> buy things for uh, weird I'm reasons. Vegans. Yeah. <laughs> As I was researching it, I got the feeling that we here, the four of us on the panel, are just different than most people out there, the majority. Yeah, because we're incredibly good looking and really cool. Well, yes. that is also so. true. But also yeah, this, tough. when we go to a liquor store, and you are working in a liquor store, oh, I look for the newest, weirdest thing oh, yeah. to try, not only because I have a podcast, but I think that's just my personality. And what Ed was talking about earlier, just try something different if you yeah. can't find the thing that you want, because you would be surprised how good things are. Right. Yeah. Friday night, I was in Atlanta. I was at the hotel bar at the end of the night, and they had Maker's Mark and Crown Royal, and they had Woodford, but they were out of it. And it's funny, they had a bottle. I said, you have a bottle of Woodford right there? He goes, that's the bottle, but there's not Woodford in there. It's like iced tea or something like that. 
like, <laughs> be oh, like oh, it's Scott. there. I'm like, oh, Scott, it's, it's Scott's trick for pictures. But Bro, you're <laughs> in the now. so they had this little blue and white label called Cooper's, and it was a weird label. It was an 82.2 proof. I said, I'll try that. I've never had that before. Interesting. Mm. And it was drinkable. Local? I don't Spirit, know. No, it was Kentucky. I haven't seen it up here. Cooper's Craft. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've okay. Heard of that. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yep, there she goes. Yep, I just tried it because it was new, and I, mean, I had four. But oh, I, hell yeah. I, I really wanted to make sure. Party in the baby. <laughs> you really right. had to make sure. I had to make sure. sure. Like, I like the first one. I think I had a double and another double, and then I had a single, and then I said, I'd be one more single. I'm not, I'm not really sure yet. Let me have another single. <laughs> We found him yeah. in the tanks at the Atlanta Aquarium. It was really yeah. wild. Yeah, exactly. Whale sharks. Yeah, exactly. Just swimming around. Yeah, at the time of his life. But, yeah. you know. Sir, why are you wet? All right. Why do you smell like fish? There's a starfish attached to the side of his face. Right. right. No, okay. We haven't drank in a while. No, we haven't. Wait, we drink on this show? Yeah. We do. So let's get to our old elk. And uh, if you've got other things to bitch about bourbon, Ed has elks, apparently, a uh, right. thing. There's about actually them. a herd of elk outside the door. I hear so, their antlers scratching. So they've been, they've not, been Wait. It's actually not the animal at all. I'll get into what it is very quickly. Okay. In 2016, after a nearly four-decade career at Seagram's and then MGP, current Old Elk Master Distiller Greg Metz worked on a okay. unique project with what would turn out to be his future company. Old Elk purchased MGP whiskey and agreed to let Greg create unique mash bills and then distill and blend specifically for them. Although Old Elk would later get their own still up and running, MGP distillation still formed the basis for over 90% of Old Elk's products, this bottle included. The reason I don't like the name is simply because Old Elk sounds like one of the ones we made fun of early on. The Old Crow, right? Yeah. The Wild Turkey. You know, old Crow is just... Very old, generic. Elk's not a really great animal either, so it's like Old Elk just it sounds like a... It's and named... You're getting them riled up outside yeah. right now. It's named like an old... Fart? Bottom shelf. No. <laughs> Old fart. <laughs> like an old whiskey from like the 50s that, you know, the bottom shelf stuff that we all see that's still sitting there. I would like to know the reason that he, they chose it. Mm. Like if it just was like Elk's Glory or something, maybe that would be better. Elk's Glory? That but, sounds like something you'd see in the bathroom. I don't yeah. know. Old Elk. What <laughs> bathroom do you go to? It's a, it's a glory, glory hole. Only the finest. Different. This is a different no, type of glory hole, Does anyone understand baby? what I'm saying? Yes, we do. We do. I, yes, I do. I'm yeah. sorry. I just, I just feel, no, I just feel like they're bringing out high premium whiskey that's aged different and blended and they're coming out with, to me, a very very, very basic name. How like, about Old Moose Knuckle? Ooh. No, I'm here for it. <laughs> you could do a lot. All right, so this is a 123.3 proof. It's aged seven years. The barrel number is 1328, if that matters to anybody. The mash bill is 51% corn, 45% rye, 5% malted barley. The distiller's Old Elk Distillery in Fort Collins, Colorado. The source distiller is MGP of Lawrence, Indiana. The price... All right, I went to look that up, and then I totally got it, distracted. It was up there. Yeah. It was at least 90. 74.99. Mm, okay. Oh, okay, so it wasn't 90. Not so then. bad. Yeah. I buy it for 90, then. Mm. Uh, I just upcharge you Something. for being <laughs> you. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I probably was looking at some of the other looks that I'd seen around, and I think that was one. So I think Benash just had better prices than when I'd seen other ones, and this is their bow pick. So I'm looking forward to trying this out. Oh, yeah. All right, well, let's uh, give it a sniff. She's definitely a hot number. She is. So funny story with this barrel pick here. So oh, we, yeah. we picked it so long ago. When it showed up, we had forgotten that we picked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do so many picks. We do a good amount of picks, yeah. but it took like well over a year plus to show up at our lovely front door. So a mysterious white truck pulled up. Dragged by elks. That's the weird part. Yes. It was it a sleigh. Sleigh. <laughs> Showed up. How does it come in? Like, just like a whole truck of cases come yes, in? Like, yeah, here's 10 cases. Have fun sticking them somewhere. Yeah. I oh. wish it was 10 cases. Right. So normally it yields like 200 plus bottles, depending on the well, barrel. Not okay. the cast strength will. Oh, it will, baby. Mm. Well, how big are your barrels the size of this kitchen? Uh, Yes, actually. <laughs> the size of an actual elk. <laughs> so yes. what are we getting on the nose? Because I'm going to tell you right now that completely different nose than the first one. And I think it's because of the proof. There's a lot of ethanol yeah. in this. It smells a little vinyl-y. Luckily, I was thinking uh, old record shop. Of this Th- there, you yeah, go. there you go. A little musty also. Yeah, but I get. Like barn. Basement. Oh, basement. Okay, yeah. So, so you think that might be the oak you're getting? Like a wet oak. Yeah, I get a lot of things that I describe as like grandparents' basement. Yeah, wet oak, that was my rap name. Uh, as opposed to grandparents' <laughs> that, kitchen. That's really funny because that Hello. was my prison name. <laughs> <laughs> so I do get some sugar on the nose, like an initial burst of sweetness, and then this mm-hmm. gets into like some herbaceous notes. Like, like deep. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Anybody get like a little cinnamon sugar like you put on a donut almost? You are making me so aggressively hungry. I mean, uh, kind of. Like, uh, yeah. there's so much non-traditional 
uh, bourbon notes on this. Yeah. That yeah, this I'm, one's funky fresh. Yeah, it's getting a little lost. This one's very complex and weird. I mean, there's definitely sweetness there. I just really can't identify it. All right, it's time to taste it. Oh, that's different. It's really different than what we just drank Ooh. earlier. Yeah. Um, it's super drying on the finish is my initial impression because I, I took a bigger gulp than I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. Oh, uh, there's so many different flavors in here. We have to really take a minute before mm-hmm. we put water on it. The pepper's way more up front on this one. The spice on your tongue hits you really quick. Absolutely. I, you know, it's funny. I get a little bit of orange on the very end. I can 100 percent see that. Yeah. I get no orange, but I get almost like a anise note, like a little mm. tiny hint of like okay. sambuca. Yeah. Mm. I get like the burnt orange. That's better. Yeah. yeah. Burnt orange. Like a burnt orange or like a candied yeah, orange. It's, yeah, because it's candied orange. Yeah. Because yeah. it's very savory. Yeah. 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 That's sugar note i'm getting is more kind of like caramelized yeah yeah i'm putting like eight drops on this one i'm trying to get this i get a lot of almost like tannic notes like you do with like Mm -hmm. a puckering like a really dry wine yeah Yeah. it's Mm -hmm. very drying likewise Mm -hmm. Mm, the water does amazing things to this yeah holy cow this would be so good on a globe for me oh i mean the orange comes out on the nose for me now with the water on it yeah much more cinnamon now. Yes, I was just going to say that the mm. cinnamon that you were getting on the nose, I'm absolutely getting on the palate now. I just smelled my microphone instead of my glass. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm new at this. I'm getting more than that. I'm getting baking spices besides cinnamon too now. Yeah, yeah. To me, this one is like very like Ooh. herbaceous, yes, like fall, it is. Yeah. like fiery cardamom. Mm. Yeah, cardamom. I, I mean, I, I often yeah. get tobacco, and I'm getting a little tobacco notes. I put even more water in it because I just yeah. because putting some on it made it so good. Oh, um, yeah. There's rye notes on this at the end, too, now. That little with, bit of spice. With the water. Yeah. It's way spicier. The water actually has opened up more spice. Yeah. yeah. Which is crazy. Honors, what, what are you thinking over there? You've been kind of you're, quiet. Yeah, you've been thinking about spilling been... onto my shirt. <laughs> well, he's a little messy over here, <laughs> so... Uh... <laughs> It's okay. He's going to put on my uh, flapper's outfit. Thank God you came in with so many outfits. <laughs> Seriously, don't I worry. I love having about options. Uh, that's right. <laughs> no, I, uh, one of the things that struck me before I added the water to it, and uh, I'm going to let this open up a little bit more. He added about eight drops. I really liked the mouthfeel on it. There was that pepper up front. It's <laughs> definitely... I feel like so visceral, like, like yeah, an oily mouthfeel. It's still sure. hanging it's on. It's really... Yeah, yeah, it like coats... It's got crazy legs it's on the nice. glass, too. So does Anders in that dress. My goodness. <laughs> The flapper dress. Check out the games on Hell that yeah. thing. Oh. See? Red, yeah. red is hey, a man. color on you, baby. She's hey, what are you doing over there wearing that flapper dress? <laughs> She's a real looker. Talk about being a swell. <laughs> I'm swelling over here. Oh my god. <laughs> Edit. <laughs> Keep it in. Keep that in. That's Keep what she in. said. That's what she said. Oh, <laughs> man. Nice one. Oh, man. Anyway. Bourbon Culture gave us the tasty notes. Mm. On the nose, very sweet, like a bowl of frosted flakes with notes of cinnamon, oak, and caramel latte. Okay, so this was their barrel, but... Right. You did get cinnamon, right. and I do now after the water. I got uh, oak, too. Yeah, very sweet, though, is not what no. we have. No, mm-hmm. yeah. no, no, this no. is not very sweet. It's no. a savory number. But I did say there was initial bursts of, like, sugar. Oh, yeah, yeah, you did. But then I said it was gone. Yeah. Like, it was, like, really quick. Palette, and once again, this isn't the exact same barrel, but oak, spice, peppercorns, mm-hmm. uh, and caramel, but softened with flavors of malt oatmeal hot cereal. They're going frosted flakes and yeah. malt cereal. Yeah, they, have, they have a very cereal thing. I'm not getting it. Table syrup, no. cinnamon stick. I can see those a too. bit of licorice fennel seed Ugh. tobacco leaf and dark chocolate shavings that is a lot a cinnamon stick is interesting <laughs> because it's not cinnamon it's, it's the full stick yeah it's, it's the like bark the, scraped off the tree it's like the potency yeah. of it i can see and it. we were getting a lot of woody kind of yeah, yeah limited stick that. it's almost like limited if, stick <laughs> <laughs> oh my um it's almost like if you're in your grandfather's basement. There was a study where he smoked cigars and avoided people. Mm. And in that study, you had some sort of like really buttery Caribbean spice cookie. Did you? Anise and cinnamon carnauba. Was your grandfather Charles Darwin? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he was. Oh, my goodness. And he was a great man. <laughs> Amazing. Hey there, fellas. Anybody, <laughs> anybody want the finishing notes? Sure, go ahead. Darker, surprising notes of prune and fig. Mm. Deepening with more robust flavor of seasoned oak, espresso grounds, and wet tobacco, while rye notes of cinnamon and cloves add a nice zing of complexity. Mm. Ooh, a little zing. Well, complexity is absolutely true. Yeah. It's very complex, almost to the point where you can't figure out what the hell you're tasting. Yeah, this dude's weird. Yeah. I don't know if I like it better than the Magnus. Surprising. I thought you would, and I would like the Magnus yeah. better. Mm. It's just so oaky and drying that I'm sort of losing 
some of the sweetness that I think it should actually have. Yes. I think I might like the Magnus a little better, but I think this might be a better whiskey. Ooh. The I old understand that. Yeah, because you could do more with it. It's so complex. I'm not drinking it the way I would drink it normally, which would be on a globe over the course of 15 minutes, mm. you know? Mm. And so I think when you look at the fact that this is technically cheaper yeah. than the other one, yeah. then this is by far a better deal. Right. Yeah. So when I said that I like the Joseph Magnet better, yeah. that's all I meant. I really like the old elk. Oh, it's yeah, very right. interesting. It just is and missing a little something. It's a very rye forward bourbon. It's very spicy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I feel like it could be a little sweeter. Yeah, maybe that's what's throwing me off because these are bourbons. We're supposed right. to be yeah. drinking bourbons yes. here. It yes. gives off a rye vibe. Very yeah. rye. It I have does. to tell you, yeah. I'll double down that by saying rye can't be as complex as this is. Exactly. So yeah. I, and I will say that, and it's not a diss on rye, but you have to have the bourbon to start with. To, well, hold you, on. You know what I mean? It's only 51% corn. It's 45% malted right. barley. So oh, the, a that's, lot of that's that's what we're saying. It's, that's why that's it why doesn't taste it's normal. Yeah, so that, that's weird. where most of the flavor, yeah, I crap, think, I is this is coming a, from. I yeah, this that. is a weird mash, Holy shit, it's, half, it's halfway to a single malt. Yeah. No uh -huh. wonder it's tasting Surprise. weird. Yeah. Oh, I feel so validated because I could not figure out why this was taking me sideways. <laughs> and I think that's why it's oh, messing yeah. us up. We tried to fit this into a traditional bourbon profile, and then we're disappointed when it wasn't there. Right. Well, it's not meant to be. No. And I'm trying to fit it into a bourbon in my mind. I'm like, this doesn't taste like a bourbon to me right no. now. But it's, it's got the 51% yeah. corn. So I mean, oh, no, it's a bourbon. Is. It's a bourbon. Right. Legally. And technically right. speaking, it's And a that's bourbon. why it's a perfect example of why it's the present of bourbon because right now. Because it's getting but, wild. And that's yep. also a perfect segue because, right. I mean, right. there yeah. we so are. The future. So we're going to wash our glasses and we'll be right back for the future of bourbon. All righty. Okay, so we're back with the future of bourbon. Future! Future, future. bourbon! <laughs> and uh, Scott's going to tell us what it looks like to him, and then we're all going to tell him what it looks like to us. Okay, yeah. So the same blog that I got the comment about the current state of bourbon, he also talked about what he thought was a prediction of the future of bourbon. Future which, of bourbon! <laughs> which I don't <laughs> necessarily agree with or not, but I thought, again, it would be a good jumping off point. Cool. All right, so here's what he said. I think the future of bourbon will be absolutely... <laughs> will be absolutely fantastic. Bourbon producers will be competing for bourbon consumers' attention. They will hold local tasting events and even send samples in the mail. Aid statements will become ubiquitous, and every single bottle of bourbon will have a statement of the years, weeks, and days it's spent in the barrel, along with full disclosure of the mash bill used. In fact, this will not be an option, but will be required by law because of consumer demand. Consumers will drive the market, and they'll know exactly what they're getting when they buy a bottle, a case, or a barrel. They'll be able to find out where all the grains come from as distiller websites will brag about the terroir much like champagnes and fine French wines today. Additionally, anyone, anywhere in the United States will be able to have whatever bourbon they want delivered to their doorstep. <laughs> People will order barrels of bourbon for weddings, retirement parties, and birthdays. In fact, drinking buddies will be able to place an order for a barrel of bourbon one night while drinking together and have those bottles delivered in four to six weeks. <laughs> The three-tier system of manufacturers, distributors, and retailers will go entirely by the wayside. Consumers will have direct contact with the manufacturers, and distributors who act as middlemen now will be bankrupted like buggy whip manufacturers in the age of automobiles. And the success or failure of both bars and liquor stores will depend on their ability to help the consumer find what the consumer wants, not merely just because they can score a liquor license. Find me and Anders in the corner, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that will ever happen. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. And he says that. He says, I'm making a bold prediction here. I think what he wants the future of that bourbon to bold, look like. That is bold, baby. That is bold. I like that future, but I don't think it'll ever happen. What's this guy's name? This guy. Uh, What's he, his address? His, his home address? His name is Brad Drill. Brad? 
I have a question for you. Mm. How is crack? <laughs> what has it done for you? When was the last time you took a nap, Brad? <laughs> Get, He's definitely enjoying it. I disagree with most of that. Mm. I do too. I wish it was true. Mm. I think we all wish it was true. Yeah. There are some things that I think he might have a hunch about that can be expounded upon. There is going to be more of a regional identity of bourbon in the future based on where it comes from. And yeah. then just American whiskey in particular. I think there are beginnings of that. Yeah, sort of now. the green to glass movement that's happening. Yes, but yeah. also just based on like climate. We live in a oh. big country with a lot of different places. Yeah. So right. Whiskey from Kentucky is different from whiskey from Indiana versus Pennsylvania versus the Northeast versus the versus Pacific Versus Texas. Northwest. Texas yes. is freaking wild. Texas <laughs> is wild and it's different. So I think over time that is going to become more of a identity and people will have a better lock on what is a Kentucky whiskey versus a right. New York whiskey versus a Texas. What we've talked about is how four years in a Rick House in Texas isn't the same as in like Michigan. Right. Yeah. It's oh, gonna, oh, shit. The whiskey is going to age a lot faster in Texas. So somehow the consumer has to be educated on that so they don't just go by an age statement and think they know what they're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like the transparency that he wants and some distillers do do all yep, of that on yep. their label. They put all of the mash bill and they put right. all of the barrels that it was in and, and how long it aged down to the week. Right. I think there has been a movement as blending and sourcing has become more common and more accepted that transparency will be likely to follow. The need to hide that you get your stuff from MGP or Bardstown or Dickel or Heaven Hill. If it's a company that has a good reputation, people are like, oh yeah, they gave Heaven Hill, that's good. Then what do they do with it? Do they put it in, a, in sherry cast or whatever? Mm, mm. So I think that he's right in the sense like you said we've already seen that and this has happened very quickly yeah and so the future of bourbon in my opinion is mgp Mm. Okay. mgp is the present but very recent present they have doubled their net income in two years okay oh yeah they make twice as much as beam some tory and heaven hill do combined you know monopolies isn't the right word here but you have a major player that has been quietly supplying many distilleries and now they're starting to flex and start to acquire competition and start to vertically integrate the industry. And I think they might go on to acquire one of the big distillers mm. and further increase their hold on the whiskey industry. They are rolling. No one's going to protest because if you protest, they'll just stop giving you the shit and they'll just make up a brand and bottle the same shit they gave you under a Rossville <laughs> Union or a, a uh, Remus. No, or, they're, they're holding all the cards. Right. I don't see them losing power. I feel like they can't be challenged right now for at least 10 years. Mm. Yeah. Thoughts on that? We talked about on our secondary market episode yeah. with Matt from the undisclosed distributor. Right. And he said that he wanted for consumers an Amazon of whiskey where you could go to a website and order whatever you want and have it shipped to you. That was like his dream. And yeah. that's kind of what this guy is saying. Right. That's kind of what MGP is, yeah, but not yeah. really for the consumer. Right. Because the state, for everyone else. It's the individual state laws that are getting our way right now. Yes. Technically, in New Jersey, you can't order whiskey online and have it sent to you. No. It's got to be all secret. It's, because People pretend. find ways around it. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. You have to click a box that says, you'll go to prison. We won't if they come for you. <laughs> So, Scott, what do you think about that? I agree. And also, everything that Barrel is doing, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's just going to continue. But they're going to start using different mash bills, different types of barrels. They're going to start right. using different finishing techniques. Yeah. Uh, either using smaller barrels or staves or, I don't know, right. something else coming into it. And someone's going to try to compete with them. And they have, right, yeah. what's the second one's got the, um, that sources like the number two sourcer? Oh, um, Bardstown Bourbon Company. Right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. So that's so a big one. Other people are going to see them start to diversify, start to keep more of their distance themselves and be like, oh, well then if there's a hole in the sourcing, we can jump in and take 5% of their market share, 7%. And if you have two or three taken 7%, they might leave a little bit of hole in the game for Mm -hmm. other sorcerers to get in yeah they have a big head start on everybody else so yeah. people need to step up now or they're going to get left behind you guys uh anders and taylor who are sort of in the industry now what trends are you seeing now that you think will continue into the future day drinking oh no that's always been there never mind <laughs> always been <laughs> 
Would you like to begin, good sir? Uh, sure. Um, so one thing that I find is probably going to be coming sooner rather than later, but not so much in the long term, is I think we're going to have a lot more premium bourbons without age statements. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, uh, I think scarcity is going to become a thing with our like over-oaked 18 to 25-year-old bourbons. And so yeah. I think... Right. That- Things that currently have an age statement, those age statements are going to go away. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, kind of right. like the Japan thing. Exactly. Um, one of the things that's interesting about predicting the future of whiskey is that it's soaked with tradition. Um, mm. I think that uh, bourbon in particular is so bound to the idea of tradition mm-hmm. that any kind of progress or change happens very gradually. Oh, interesting. Um, Ooh. I think we're going to get more weird finishes, more multiple finishes. Mm. Rather blending than too. blending, yeah. But I think over like flavored whiskeys, RTD is ready to drink uh, yep. like canned stuff. Yeah, you're right. There has to be something to appeal to the new generation, Anders. Yeah, and maybe switch them into like the regular, more traditional bourbons when they're older. But how do you get a 24, 25 year old interested in bourbon? I feel that you're not going to take a bottle of bourbon to tailgate, you right. know, or like party on the weekends or stuff like that. I will. Anders yeah. is a different breed. Yeah. He's going to be like, okay, everybody, I brought my fanny pack and it is full of shakers and <laughs> I brought Limes a bunch of lemons and, <laughs> and I've infused this thing for the past three days to prepare for this evening. I've got my pomegranate. Yeah, he just goes, here's my pomegranate, but I did not bring any dragon fruit because I'm not feeling it no. today. Not today. So. Uh, yeah, his full bartender chic. But there's definitely a time and a place, you know, because in the past, bourbon was very gentrified for the most part. Like, solely men would drink bourbon, women would drink vodka cocktails. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right now, we're seeing more women in whiskey. We're seeing female distillers. We're yeah. seeing female-owned brands. There's some powerhouse distillers, both women in, in bourbon, women in scotch, mm-hmm. that people don't even know exist. And right. they are just killing it in the game. But I find people are getting into more like making cocktails when they have people over at night. There's difference between like parties, between between tailgating at the Eagles game, at the Phillies game, at like whatever concert you're going to, and then having people over enjoying the space, enjoying like a, a nice bourbon or a cocktail or something that's much more mature, which where I think the future is going is different finishes, which is like the elevated version mm. of like, you know, your Evan Williams apple, your crown vanilla. Yeah. 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 I think like, like the Manhattan barrel finish from Sagamore that we all tried. Oh, you, that was so good. That that's coming out in the fall. I got uh, some word from some special people at Sagmore. All but right, so let me ask this question to you guys. Do you think this bourbon boom that's happening right now is ever going to end? Yes. Yes. All right. Yes, wow, I do. Wow, that was... Absolutely. That yes in red. Yeah. And what will fill the void? Vodka? Vodka so, comes back? No. From the no. Beat down? No. No. Uh, tequila? Or rum? So what I see every day, people are tired of chasing bourbon that they can't get. We see rum. People are getting really into tiki, um, yes. scotch. Yes. Tiki but drinks? Tiki drinks, oh. yeah. Yes. Getting into... You mean like a... For, for like a so no. Like, oh, no. Uh, like 19... Agricole. F- yeah, rum yeah. agricole, 1950s. Okay, you okay. got your Mai Tais, like all the traditional... Oh, like Anders just changed. Yeah. Oh, did I? He's wearing a fancy outfit. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, I'm, I'm wearing a hula skirt. skirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that was so fast. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> What about other types of whiskey? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Like rye Reeling whiskeys and yeah. scotch well, and Irish. Single, malt, single malts in America. Single malts American in America. single malts are definitely going to be part of the whiskey scene in this country. Mm-hmm. Major distilleries are now putting energy into them. Yeah. Shout out to Old Line. And, yeah. and Stranahan's out in Colorado has just been putting out oh. really good stuff. McCarthy's out in the pack Northwest to just bring the whole country yeah. together. Yeah. It's all smoky and they give us some answers to the scotch and Japanese single malts that have been flooding yeah. the markets for years. Right. Just today when I went to Benash and I said this to you, Taylor, in the aisle when we were looking for a future bourbon, yeah, which was my, really hard to kind of quantify because you don't... a panic attack. Yeah, you don't know what a future of bourbon might be. But what I noticed was going to a few liquor stores and in Benash, there's a lot fewer bourbons on the shelves in the whiskey aisle than you realize. Yeah. There's a lot of rye, there's a lot of American single malts, of course, Scotch and Irish and Japanese, but all manner of different just what's called whiskey now because they can't call it a bourbon because their rules are so restrictive. Yes. Right. And specifically something that I wanted to look for for the future sells so quickly mm. and that's people looking for something different. Yeah. And for the longest time, I found that people had such a way about 
finished bourbon, Mm -hmm. whether it was like, you know, somebody who ran some Facebook group or like one of their friends was like, finished bourbon is crap, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it creates such an extra layer. There's honey barrels, which are wild. There's VDN casts. Yeah. And there's Amarana, which people just want now. Yeah, right. There's That's the Brazilian Tokai. One? Right. And Taylor Scotch has been doing this for, yeah, for decades. They Forever. Have been. And, yeah. I, and I guess the bourbon is just really following in that footstep. 100%. It's being yeah. dragged through it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we can talk more about the future of bourbon, but I think we are thirsty. Oh, my God. Oh, right. Totally we drink on this right. show. <laughs> we got to drink now. Talk. I'm glad you said that because I'm dying over here. <laughs> Sorry. I could talk literally forever. So we have a very interesting bottle we're bringing out for today. It's a straight bourbon whiskey that's 116 proof. Do you know the match bill for us? It is a four grain. Um, I constantly forget it, so I can always call Bill, do a celebrity spot. We don't do phone a friend here. (laughs) I'm just going to crawl into the garbage disposal. No, no. So it's a bourbon, so it's got to be at least 51% corn. It's it's well over 50% corn. Mm -hmm. But a four grain, so it's got wheat, rye, and malted barley. Yes, that is incredibly correct. All right. And it's a takeoff on the Colonel E.H. Taylor. It's called Colonel Taylor, but it's spelled K E R N E L. Like corn. And it has a color picture of our own guest tonight, Taylor. There she is. Hi, it's me. I'm here. You have your face on a bottle. Eating an ear of corn. Um, yes, taken by one of my great friends, Maggie. Her neighbor has corn, and I ate it raw. You ate it. Wow. New Jersey sweet corn, baby. Can't beat it. Yep. Taylor eats it raw. Heard it here first. <laughs> We don't have tasting notes online for this. You're going to have to give us what you think it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I picked this bottle and I will tell you why and I will let why, why and why? I will let you three magical mm. people give me the tasting notes All on right. it. All right. It's such a nice nose. I get like a cherry cola or something yeah. on it. I was just going to say that. Very, very sweet. Yeah. Very approachable. Yeah. So for being a four grain, it definitely has a much more of a bourbon nose than I expected. Yeah. Yeah. So I picked this guy because to me was the perfect bottle that I would take camping. So I love camping. I love going to off the wall music festivals, like folk festivals, blues festivals, whatever with my dad. And uh, also this would be a perfect one to like put in my pack in like a flask and sit at a campfire. It's campfire whiskey. It is campfire whiskey. You hear that Gabe in the pineys down there? This one's for you. (laughs) Hey Gabe. I feel oh, like yeah. A, this is really good. It's yeah. sweet and it's spicy at the end. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But it warms you. It's hot when you drink it, but it's mm-hmm. not like no. I'm going to die. Hot. There is a lot of heat to it. I mean, it's 116 proof, but mm-hmm. it's like you said, it's a good heat. Yeah. Yeah. I put some water it's on cozy. it. It automatically opened up. Five drops mm-hmm. of water does this amazing. Um, it's so traditional. No, it's really caramel, good. vanilla, definitely cherries, definitely a little pepper on the finish for mm-hmm. sure. Mm hmm. It almost reminds me of like a strawberry cotton candy or something, like mm. some kind of like really mm. fine, light, airy sweetness. Mm. I mean, you guys can obviously tell me if it sucks because uh, oh no, not no. just because Super I'm here. Good. It's a First of all, we zone, wouldn't baby. do that on the air anyway. But um, <laughs> You're like, wow, Taylor is the worst thing I've ever in my life. Right? I would just you hear the sound of me pouring it out in the background <laughs> and Taylor crying. <laughs> This gets a pour out. Riding, riding away on the back of the right. elk. Her crying just gets quieter as she runs down the hallway. And then you hear hooves. <laughs> oh, no. The tears of the elk. Honors, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this? Oh, this is phenomenal. Yeah. Aww. Thanks, um, everybody. Yeah. Sweet caramelized bourbon nose kind of giving way to like rye, and it reads like that on the palate as well. Yeah. Caramely. I have to go camping now this summer. Right? So right? Yeah, it's let's just, all go camping. I would love to go. I love it. This was MGP, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm. Yes. So this Once is, again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what a surprise. Once again, Ed's a future of bourbon. Yes. Future bourbon. Here it is. So one final thing that I thought was interesting, and it's a sort of a foreshadowing to next episode. I asked artificial intelligence. Oh, Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> what the future of bourbon would be. Yes. And I just want to read it as we close out this episode. Thank you, Anders and Taylor. So I asked Chat GPT, the newer version, uh, what is the future of bourbon? And it said this. As an AI, I don't have real-time information, but as of my last knowledge update in September 2021, bourbon was a popular and thriving spirit with a rich history. It's difficult to predict the specific future of bourbon, but based on trends at that time, it was gaining global recognition and experiencing a surge in popularity. Bourbon producers were exploring innovative techniques, experimenting with new flavors, and catering to evolving customer preferences. The industry was also witnessing increased interest in craft and small batch bourbons. To get the most accurate and up-to-date information on the future of bourbon, I recommend consulting 
interviewing industry experts or staying informed through current news and trends, which is exactly what we did. We That's go. right. You're welcome. All right. I mean, the future is whatever it's going to be. If you don't have fun finding out, it's your own fault. Yeah. You can That's just come to Menashe and I'll make it fun. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. And if you don't live in the area, just call them up. They'll ship to you. It. Well, we can't ship. We oh, got, it. We got in a lot of trouble during COVID. Oh. Yeah, I got... All right, so forget what I, got, I just said. I huh? got biggity busted. But you can always just call Vinash. I um, love to talk. And <laughs> I can look for your local retailers. Right, just ask don't, if they have right. lanterns. Yeah, just don't... Yeah. <laughs> if it no, starts don't out... Do you have blontines? I will probably be like, as a matter of fact... <laughs> Click. <laughs> Fart noise. All right, so we want to thank Anders and Taylor for, for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed our three-part episode on the history of bourbon, the past, the present, and the future. Get out there and do your own research. It's all fun. So for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. I'm Scott. I'm Anders. And I'm Taylor. Mm. Cheers. (laughs) Later.